calls to save Kelly Gissendaner's life echoed outside the state prison in Jackson, Georgia on Tuesday night. But after more than five hours of delays, the 47-year-old, who spent 18 years in prison for plotting the murder of her husband, was given a lethal injection. As always, the final segment of the program tonight will be my commentary, telling it like it is. This evening, a personal take on the death penalty and how my opinion of it was forever shaped. It won't sit well with some people and will likely enrage plenty. But the issue of putting people to death for heinous crimes against humanity is one that shows no sign of being resolved. The execution of a woman in Georgia and the standoff over a killer in Oklahoma prove it. How do we stop going in a never-ending circle over the issue? And can we ever hope to balance morality with earthly justice? Our guest is chairman of the Criminal Justice Department at John Jay College in New York and a former capital litigator, Evan Mandery. Evan, I want to thank you for joining us. And that question that I asked right there, is it not fair to say that that is the thing that vexes us no matter what we do? How do we balance it? We continue to try and talk about it becoming something that doesn't have needless suffering for the individual who's convicted. But there's never an answer. We've been chasing our tail on this for decades. Right. I mean, I guess it depends how you frame the question. And uh, if you view it as a moral question, then it's a difficult question to answer because obviously the surviving victims have, uh, have interests that deserve to be taken very seriously. But if you frame it as a question of public policy, there's pretty broad consensus at this point that the death penalty isn't contributing to uh, deterrence in any way, isn't really accomplishing anything of value for the criminal justice system. All right, I'm going to play devil's advocate here on that as well, because there are those people who have said, I'm sure you've heard this, that if someone is convicted and if someone is sentenced to the death penalty and you carry that death penalty out immediately without waiting for years and decades of appeals, that it would make a difference. It would be a deterrent. How do you answer those people? Right. I mean, it's, you know, it's not just being devil's advocate. It's fair. I, I try to be honest about what the evidence shows. Um, it's not that the evidence, that there is no evidence that the death penalty deters. There's very little evidence that the death penalty deters. And the evidence that exists um, shows that it deters very little. And to your point, in states like Texas that execute people very regularly, um, you might get a tiny bit more deterrence, but still, still very small. The question is, is it a penalty in that form that you could actually live with? I guess also where we're going is, and let's be very honest, there are people who have been on death row who have been found innocent, who have been found that they are there and they aren't the right people. They weren't the, the people who committed the crime. So we have to take that into account as well. Are we coming to a point where we're going to almost split the death penalty? Those people for whom there may be questions as to whether or not they're actually guilty and those, for instance, who have the gun in their hand, it's smoking, the knife in their hand, and they have the body right below them. And at that point, we have to say that that's an immediate death penalty case. These need to be looked at longer. Right. That's a smart point. I mean, uh, there are some scholars who su have suggested that the burden of proof in a, in a capital case should actually be proof to a certainty or as close um, thereto as possible instead of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So that would be an interesting proposition. And the death penalty sure would seem a lot different if it were reserved for those cases. You know, I grew up in Long Island, so Colin Ferguson is the one that always comes to my mind where, you know, you have 25 witnesses to the smoking gun and no question whatsoever about, of guilt. But of course... That's not the typical uh, person who's on death row. All right. Now, in his address to Congress recently, Pope Francis, on his American tour, he called for a global abolition of the death penalty. Here's what he said. Since every life is sacred, every human person is endowed with an inalienable dignity, and society can only benefit from the rehabilitation of those convicted of crimes. Now let's add to that. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia said just last week he would not be surprised to see the death penalty abolished soon. Do you feel we're on that track? Oh, I, I, I'm sure it's going to happen. It's just a question of when. I mean, it, it just can't be. I say this to my students and my kids all the time. Um, it's not going to be 50 years from today that America will continue to be the only uh, westernized nation that retains the death penalty. The question is how it's going to end. And there will be some states, especially in the South, that are going to be dragged uh, kicking and screaming away from the death penalty. And that's the question. That's where the question whether the Supreme Court is ever going to intervene comes into play. 
Here's another question, too, because I've had this brought up in my face by a number of people in the last couple of weeks. There are those who claim that the death penalty in itself is unconstitutional, the Founding Fathers never meant for it to happen here in America, and that basically this is a, a bastardization of the law and the Constitution itself. Constitutionally speaking, then, where are you on this? Uh, well, I, I, I think the death penalty is, is cruel and unusual punishment, but, but not for the reason of what the Founding Fathers believed. Uh, the, death, the death penalty, capital punishment is mentioned in five different places in the Constitution. It's, even if they didn't all like it, it's clear that as a, a pragmatic matter, they recognized that it uh, existed and that the Constitution wasn't going to change that. So constitutionally then, in your opinion, and in a, constitu a legal sense then, if you will, it is then constitutional, yes? Well, the Supreme, yeah, it is right. I mean, in, you know, in Greg v. Georgia, the Supreme Court said that the, uh, a death penalty as then practiced in the United States was constitutional. So it's easy to give an answer from that standpoint. That's what the Supreme Court says. I've got about 30 seconds left. I'm curious. When you talk to your students, how do they feel about this? Do you sense that they are people who want this? Uh, you're, you're taking a breath there because I'll bet you you discuss this every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I love it. I mean, it sounds like you do, too. Uh, it's great. Um, but, you know, I don't exactly have a representative cross-section of uh, the American people. I have college students. and um, Do you get a you feel, know, though, that they would like to see it abolished as well or that they'd like to see it continued? There's no question that our children's generation is much more tolerant and, uh, in general and much more pragmatic in approaching these questions. And that is something, of course, that the Supreme Court and others will have to deal with. And in the meantime, we will have to deal with this continuing for the time being, of course. Evan Mandry, I want to thank you so much for being with us. We do appreciate it. Let me also ask you, you get a chance to tell us on social media how you feel about this and if you're part of that generation that says, now's the time to shut down the death penalty. But coming up next, how Theodore Bundy taught me about the death penalty in telling it like it is.